The first time I saw my husband George's grandmother Elsie Berry was shortly after our wedding in 1965. I was 18, she was 76. This portrait from 1968 is exactly how I remember her all these years later when we walked into her old two-story house in a shabby neighborhood in Lansing, Michigan. My first glimpse of her was from below. She was teetering near the top of a tall ladder she had set up in her living room, scraping paint off the ceiling. I suppose she might have been scraping an area where there was a water stain on the ceiling to repaint it. She hustled down the ladder and headed for the kitchen to get the same refreshments she always served when you came to visit, a little tray featuring glasses of Tang orange drink and a little plate of vanilla wafer cookies. Tang had been invented as an orange juice substitute in 1959, but didn't sell very well until 1962 when it was taken aboard the first orbiting spaceship piloted by John Glenn. From then on, it was included on almost every space flight, which created an advertising bonanza for the manufacturer. Urban legend had it that NASA had invented it for the space program, but that wasn't true. It was just a standard old powdered drink mix made for Earthlings. And although it was used in space because it was quick and easy to mix with water, that doesn't necessarily mean it was enjoyed in space. As a matter of fact, in an interview in 2013, iconic astronaut Buzz Aldrin admitted that in his opinion, as he put it, Tang sucks. But in 1965, Elsie Berry no doubt thought it was a classy, modern drink to serve guests. On her way to the kitchen, Elsie invited us to settle into her aging couch or one of the ancient threadbare chairs in the living room. Like most grandmothers of the time, every piece of sitting furniture had lacy handmade doilies carefully draped and pinned over the back and over the arms with upholstery pins. These are not photos of those actual chairs, but they might as well be. This is exactly what Elsie's doily bedecked furniture looked like. It was never really clear to me what the doilies were for. Some folks claimed they were to protect the furniture from hair oils on the backs and from wear and tear on the arms, but I think many housewives were just using them to make shabby furniture look more special. This is a 1971 photo of my mother-in-law, Lucy Dewey, Elsie's daughter, holding my daughter, Ramona, in Elsie's living room. As you can see, doilies showed up on the surface of just about any furniture, including on side tables and the tops of pianos under photos and knickknacks. You didn't buy doilies, of course. They were a decorative item that almost every woman of a certain generation, including my own grandmother and mother, knew how to crochet. And crochet many doilies they did, as it was an inexpensive way to fancy up your home. Over the next decade that I knew Elsie Berry, her looks pretty much never changed. Here she is in 1974 with Lucy and Ramona when Ramona had just turned four. In 1975, a year before she died, Elsie and Lucy brought Ramona along with them to a portrait shoot arranged by the local Congregational Church as a fundraiser. Yes, when I knew Elsie Berry in person from 1965 to 1976, I thought of her as a nice, sweet old lady who always spoke kindly and who seemed pretty spunky and kept physically busy even up into her 70s and 80s. I knew she had a few hobbies. She did a bit of woodworking, that's a huge knotty pine hutch in the middle that she built herself, displaying her collection of china souvenir plates from all over the states. On the bottom right, on the living room wall above our heads, are a couple of her paintings. Like Grandma Moses, she had taught herself to paint landscapes when she was 70s. She collected rocks on various trips she took to the western U.S. and belonged to a rock hound club. And of course, she pro crocheted doilies. And yet, as I look back now, when I am almost Elsie's age when I met her, I didn't really know Elsie Berry at all. Like many young people, I tended to just look at people I knew in older generations as if they were frozen in time and had no backstory at all. Being a self-absorbed young person, it never occurred to me when visiting Elsie in her home, as I was doing in this photo, to actually ask her any questions about her life before I met her. And being the unassuming, polite person she was, it seemed to not occur to her to bring up the subject on her own, lest she seemed to be bragging. I could kick myself now for not taking advantage of the opportunity when I had it to pick her brain and get her to talk about her life experiences. Because as I was to learn years after her death, there was a lot in her brain and a huge collection of fascinating life experiences I could have tapped into. Lucy had inherited all of Elsie's belongings in the year 1976 when Elsie died. 
And when Lucy died in 2000, George and I ended up inheriting all of the leftover belongings of the lifetimes of both Elsie and Lucy. George was incapacitated with a foot injury at the time of Lucy's death, so I inherited the job of going through all those belongings to decide what to do with them. And that is when I discovered the Elsie I never knew. Rummaging in boxes, I found scores of photos and letters and other documents belonging to Elsie going clear back to the 1800s. As I sorted through them, I began pulling together an amazing story. And with the help of some research on the internet, I have been able to add some context to the items I had found. That's the story I will be sharing in the rest of this documentary mini biography of an amazing woman, Elsie Barnard Berry, and her life and times. Elsie's story starts in Michigan in 1889, where the red dot is on this map, just outside the little town of Fowlerville in Livingston County, Michigan, which is on the road between the state capital of Lansing and the big city of Detroit. In a humble farmhouse on March 8, 1889, Lucy and Edward Barnard welcomed their second child into the world, little Elsie Beatrice Barnard. In March 1891, just after Elsie turned two years old, much of the town of Fowlerville, including most of the business district, was wiped out by fire. But Fowlerville was a plucky little town, and by 1900, the plucky local business people had rebuilt most of the business district and were back in business. This is what it looked like by the time Elsie was in late grade school. Edward and Lucy Barnard's first child had been a boy named Harry, born in 1885. Here is Elsie's big brother Harry with Edward and Lucy on the family farm when Harry was in his late 20s. Lucy Barnard, like most farm wives, was no doubt busy all the time with raising two children and lots of chickens. By 1905, Elsie was entering her senior year at the Fowlerville High School, shown here as it looked around that time. And thus, she was one of the seniors of the Fowlerville High School class of 06 as you will see in this copy of the Fowlerville High School Tatler Yearbook for 1906. Here are senior class photos of that auspicious group. First, there are the young men, all three of them. Leslie Lane, described tongue-in-cheek as High Chief Steeplechaser, Frank Ryerson, who was Big Chief Pig Chaser, and Ernest Deffendorf, known as Most Excellent Grave Digger. I'm sure there must have been some hilarious hijinks pulled by these three musketeers, to earn them those nicknames they seemed to wear proudly, or at least some pranks pulled that they thought were hilarious. And here are the senior class photos of the young ladies of the class of aught six. Miss Lula Calkins, Miss Ethel Stowe, Miss Bessie Crowfoot, Miss Willabelle Farmer, and our very own Miss Elsie Barnard. As you'll note, these ladies evidently didn't pull off many hijinks and therefore earned no nicknames, at least not in public. Even though all we have to go by is this school yearbook from over 100 years ago, we can get just a tiny hint of the personalities of these eight young folks from the chart on the next page of the Tatler, maybe even more than we expected to. For instance, Ernest evidently fancied himself as a masher and gives that as his profession. If you haven't heard that word before, take a listen to this definition from the web, quote, in the late 19th century, from the moment that American women were granted the freedom to leave their houses unescorted, they encountered a pest known as the masher, unquote. As another internet definition put it, quote, a masher was generally a smarmy, mustachioed fop. This unfamiliar man winked at or brushed up against a shop girl on the streetcar, loomed over and stalked a working woman walking down the street, called out, hey, turtle dove, to teenage girls. There were a number of ways a woman could fend off a masher, including umbrellas or hat pins, and even the martial art of jujitsu recently introduced to America. But back to the 1906 senior class of Fowlerville, Michigan High School. You have to wonder if Mr. Ernest actually had some of the characteristics further described on the web for mustachioed mashers. The most galling mashers groped, hugged, and kissed any girl or woman they declared irresistible. Ernest didn't have a mustache yet, but I can detect a bit of a smarmy fop in his look. Oh, and he had the ambition to eventually be a president. And there you have it. 
100 years ahead of an actual president who at one point bragged publicly that he was prone to groping and kissing any girl or woman he decided was irresistible. But let's move on from Ernest. Next was Frank, whose ambition was to know something and was said to be always found with the girls. Not sure what to make of that, but he was definitely not as flamboyant as Ernest, although I'm also not sure what to make of his pig chasing. The third musketeer of the senior class was Leslie. Perhaps Leslie was the geek of the group. He indicated his profession at the time was independent chemist and that he could regularly be found in chemistry. And then there were the ladies. Lula fancied herself an acrobat whose big ambition was to show off at graduation and who was described as always quarreling with Ethel, although we're not told what they quarreled about. As for Ethel, she seemed to fancy herself a rocker, which I assume in 1906 meant something entirely different than it meant a century later. It was said of her that she was always found working, and her pet expression was, do as you please, I don't care. Bessie was obviously the budding feminist suffragist of the group. She claimed to be aiming at a profession of politician and to have the ambition to be an old maid and was said to be always found being busy. Nothing mentioned about her taking jujitsu classes, but I wouldn't doubt that might have been in her future. In case you weren't aware of it, classes for women in the Japanese martial art of jujitsu weren't just to prepare young ladies to deal with mashers. They were particularly popular among those involved actively in the suffragist movement in both the U.S. and the U.K. This was particularly true after an event in 1910 known as Black Friday in the U.K. On that day, 300 suffragettes who were protesting in front of the Parliament building were assaulted by police and male vigilantes in the crowd. Many suffragettes were seriously injured. Two died and 100 were arrested. From then on, suffragettes started wearing stiff cardboard over their ribs under their clothing for protection, and some suffrage leaders organized jujitsu classes. And from reports of the time, it often worked on both heckling bystanders and police. Perhaps Bessie even ended up a decade later marching on the line with the suffrage protesters in front of the White House in January 1917 picketing President Woodrow Wilson. On the opposite end of the activist spectrum was Willabell, obviously the non-feminist of the group. Her aim was to be a farmer's wife, and she obviously spent much of her free time writing letters to MAC. No, that isn't someone named Mac. MAC stood for Michigan Agricultural College in Lansing, Michigan, where budding farmers went to become modern scientific farmers. Since Willabell's pet expression was, if he were only here, it's obvious she had a college-age boyfriend, maybe even a fiancé who was a student at MAC whom she pined after. Perhaps he was even one of the aspiring dairy farmers in this MAC Dairy Farming School Class of Aught 6 photo. Lansing was only 30 miles away, but for a small-town girl in 1906 with no auto, it might as well have been 300. She would likely only see him on holidays. It's fun to wonder if she finally ended up marrying her modern farmer. But back to the star of our movie, Elsie Barnard. You can learn a lot about Elsie just in this little chart that will be confirmed later on in our story. She professed to be an affectionate dreamer, but one who didn't want to be tied down. She could always be found alone, and her pet expression was, I don't care what the other girls do. A good summary of this might be that she was a warm, imaginative, but independent and spunky woman. Although she looked pretty sedate and dignified in that senior picture we just saw, here's another photo from the same general time period. And her much less sedate and much spunkier expression seems to me to be one of, don't mess with me. In the fall of 1906, Elsie went off to what was called Normal College. No, that didn't mean it was the opposite of a college that would have been abnormal. It was specifically a term for a college where teachers were trained in the norms of educational theory and curriculum of the time. 
The Michigan State Normal College at the time was in Ypsilanti, Michigan, about 60 miles southeast of Fowlerville. One of the main buildings on the campus is shown here on a postcard I found on the web, probably sent by a normal college student to an uncle back home at the time of the 1907 graduation. And here is a panoramic view of more of the campus photographed in 1908. The college started as Michigan State Normal School in 1853, and by 1899 it became the Michigan State Normal College when it created the first four-year curriculum for a normal college in the nation. Elsie Barnard didn't take the four-year program. The college was still offering a two-year degree that would equip the graduate with the qualifications to apply for a teaching certificate from the state, allowing them to accept a kindergarten through eighth grade teaching position throughout Michigan, as well as in most other states. Here's the whole Barnard family around the time Elsie graduated from Michigan State Normal and got her teaching degree. In some ways, even coming from a humble farm family in a very small town, Elsie was a typical cultured young woman of her era with a strong education and an appreciation for the arts, including playing piano. Like other young women of her time, she obviously enjoyed the latest fashions, including those big old elaborate hats that needed big old hat pins, as you can see in this fashionable little strip of photos that she and a friend posed for at some local photography studio. I'll bet both had hat pins poked into those fancy hats big enough to fend off any masher who might have cost them on the streets of Fowlerville. Elsie also had an appreciation for the outdoors and for animals, as you can see in this photo of her in fashionable dress, gently perhaps feeding an apple to a horse on the Barnard family farm. But within a year from the time this photo was taken, refined, fashionable, college-educated Elsie Barnard underwent a totally unexpected transformation, although she did keep up her relationship with horses. Yes, within a year or so, this is what Elsie looked like on a regular basis. Gone is the elegant fancy hat replaced with a practical floppy one that pulled down nicely on the head and needed no hat pin. Gone is the lacy dress replaced with a denim split skirt for riding a horse, leather gloves and cuffs, and look closely next to her elbow. Yes, that's a leather gun holster on her hip with a gun handle peeking out. You can see that holster in this photo too, except it's empty. This new Elsie is holding a handgun a gun which Elsie was happy to exhibit for you that she knew how to use. As you can see in this photo where she is drawing a bead on the photographer whose shadow you see on the ground in front of her. No, Elsie had no need for a hat pin, and I'm suspicious no mashers messed with her. But how on earth did we get from the Elsie on the left to the Elsie on the right? It all started with this letter. Years before Elsie was born, some members from her mother's side of the family had decided to take advantage of homesteading opportunities in the West and headed out in covered wagons from Michigan to Wyoming and Montana. They had put down roots out there in the Wild West but kept in touch with family back in Michigan. One of those Montana family members was a young woman named Ivy Van Gorder, one of Elsie's cousins who lived in Pearl, Montana. Evidently, when word got out to Ivy that her cousin Elsie had graduated from Teachers College back in Michigan in June 1908, she got real excited. A local school in Pearl, Montana needed a teacher for the upcoming school year starting in fall 1908. Wouldn't it be great if cousin Elsie could be that teacher? And thus, she wrote to Elsie, suggesting she put in an application with Mr. Thompson, the area school superintendent. Elsie decided she liked the idea and sent off her resume to Mr. Thompson, and thus it was that Ivy mailed this letter to Elsie on July 25th, 1908. Dear cousin, received your letter and card last night. All kinds of clothing is high here, so you had better bring clothes enough with you, but don't bring nice ones. We don't dress up much here. We are not going to the mountains this fall. Yes, come to Sheridan and put up at the Sheridan Inn, and we will be after you. Take the CB and Q from Chicago through Omaha. You'd better start the first of the week so you won't have to lay over. There's been several applications for our school, but I wrote to Mr. Thompson. With love, Cousin Ivy. P.S. There are lots of teachers here, but not many good ones. Don't let anything keep you from coming. 
Mother would be so disappointed if you didn't come. Cousin Claude said he was coming here quite a while ago, but he hasn't. With love, goodbye, till we meet. Mother says it's 30 years since she's seen any of her folks. We only get our mail twice a week. It's five miles to the office. I'm going today to mail this. As you notice on the envelope, Ivy's address was Pearl, Montana. But she was giving Elsie directions to get to Sheridan, Wyoming. That's because Sheridan was the closest town to Pearl, Montana that had a railroad station. Sheridan was about 15 miles directly south of the Wyoming-Montana border, and that would have put the trip by wagon, probably over fairly rustic roads, about 15 miles for Ivy and family to come to Sheridan to pick up Elsie. A 15-minute or so trip by station wagon over paved roads in 2021, but likely a two or three hour trip by horse-drawn wagon in 1908. CB and Q in the letter was the acronym for the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad Line that had routes that could take you straight from Chicago to Sheridan. The trip for Elsie from Fowlerville to Sheridan would have been about 1,400 miles. Google Maps shows you could make that trip by auto in 2021 over modern expressways in about 20 hours drive time. For most folks these days, that would be about a three-day trip, giving time for comfort stops and meal stops and motel stops. But of course, there were no superhighways or even paved roads for autos heading out west back then. This is Horatio Nelson Jackson during his famous road trip in 1903, when he became the first person to drive all the way from the Pacific to the Atlantic in one trip. At the time, there were only 150 miles of paved roads in the whole nation, and all of those were inside city limits. And by the time Elsie was going to head from Michigan to Wyoming in 1908, things weren't much better. Even the trains were pretty slow, especially in areas out west where the tracks weren't always that dependable. Elsie would have taken a train from Fowlerville to Chicago and then transferred to a CB and Q train for the rest of the trip. I'm not sure how many stops there would have been along the way to pick up new passengers or how fast the train would have been able to travel, likely somewhere between 50 and 100 miles per hour on average. But Ivy's advice to head out at the first of the week seems to indicate that there would be several days with maybe having to lay over in some city at some point if you were en route on the weekend. I certainly hope Elsie had enough cash on hand to pay for a berth in a Pullman sleeping car. Trying to sleep hunched over in a railroad seat much of the time for several days would have been pretty miserable. Likely sometime in August 1908, Elsie Beatrice Barnard, age 19, made her way to the Fowlerville train station to embark on the first leg of her solo trip to Sheridan, Wyoming. Here is the exact model of CB&Q steam engine that would have pulled Elsie's train in 1908. Most of her trip would have been across the flat farmlands of Illinois, Iowa, and Nebraska, which are even flatter than the area around Fowlerville, Michigan, which is pretty flat. But on the last leg of her trip, this is the view she would have seen out the train window as she approached Sheridan. That is a picturesque portion of the Bighorn Mountains in the distance, with lots of rolling foothills leading up to them. Anyone headed to Sheridan two decades before Elsie did would have had to come by wagon, like this family, in 1886. When Wyoming became a state in 1890, there were less than 300 people in Sheridan. Before statehood, big business corporations back east didn't pay much attention to the sparsely settled territory. But as soon as Wyoming became a state, it became obvious how potentially rich it was in natural resources needed for industries back east, the railroad set up and took notice. The owners of the Missouri and Burlington Railroad, later to be named Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, began investing heavily in running rails to Wyoming to tap into this new source of resources and new markets for manufactured goods. In 1892, the rails reached into Sheridan and a train yard and train station at the edge of town became the focal point for rapid growth. Suddenly, Sheridan was a boom town with several thousand residents and local mining and a local lumber industry supplying timber and coal for the railroad. By the 1900 census, the population was up to 1,559. And by the time Elsie arrived in 1908, it was almost up to 8,500 and was a bustling modern city. So here is the crowded depot she would have encountered at the end of her 1,400-mile journey in the boom town of Sheridan, Wyoming. 
When Elsie stepped off the train next to the Sheridan Depot and looked into the distance towards the city, the first thing she would have spotted, almost within walking distance, was the Sheridan Inn that Ivy had mentioned in her letter. Railroad companies at the time didn't just build track and run trains. They invested heavily in establishing and expanding the towns where they put their depots to assure a growing business for their passenger and freight services. So when the CB&Q made Sheridan part of its itinerary, it invested heavily in local business and industry. Part of that development program included constructing the Sheridan Inn. When the inn opened in 1893, many declared it to be the finest hotel between Chicago and San Francisco. Big game hunting out west was extremely popular at the time, and the inn attracted hunting parties made up of wealthy and well-known people from across the U.S. The inn is still in business in 2021, and these next pictures of the interior are as it looks today. But it has been carefully kept looking very much like it would have in 1908 when Elsie Berry stayed there. The inn was the town's first building illuminated by electricity. Its 156 lights turned on automatically at dusk and off at midnight. The first time the switch was turned on to activate the newfangled lighting system, hundreds of Sheridan citizens gathered at the Wynn Inn to witness the historic event. Many had not seen electricity in use before, and their enthusiasm after seeing lights in action spread demand for this modern convenience across the region. In addition to electricity, the inn was the first hotel in that area of the state to have running water throughout the building, bathtubs, and steam heat piped into every room. The inn had 64 bedrooms on the second and third floors, each with a nice view from a big dormer window. The first floor featured a 160-seat dining room, as well as a lobby, kitchen, and the famous Buffalo Bill Bar. As you may have guessed, the Buffalo Bill Bar was named for William F. Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill. Yes, the Buffalo Bill, who was the most famous for his Wild West show and Congress of Rough Riders of the World that wowed crowds all over the U.S. and Europe from 1883 until his death in 1917. The original registry book at the Sheridan Inn has the signature of W.F. Cody first arriving on January 8, 1894. Over the next several years, the Sheridan Inn became Buffalo Bill's base of operations in northern Wyoming. He immediately began investing in Sheridan in 1894, first purchasing a stake in the Sheridan Inn. Bill himself special ordered the Oak and Mahogany Bar from England. It had been shipped in sections by train to Gillette, Wyoming, and then hauled 110 miles to Sheridan by an ox-drawn wagon. Buffalo Bill also worked with the inn's manager to provide transportation for guests. Located in stables behind the Sheridan Inn, the W.F. Cody Transportation Company provided stagecoach service. And from the point of view of the local population and visitors at the inn, perhaps the most exciting thing Bill did during the period when he was directing his Wild West show business from Sheridan was to audition acts for his Wild West show right on the front lawn of the Sheridan Inn. Onlookers could sit on the expansive hotel veranda or stand around the edge of the lawn and watch the active auditions as you see this large crowd doing. If you look closely, you can see a man in a full Indian headdress along with other warriors hiding behind the stand of trees on the right. They are likely getting ready to confront a crowd of rough riders who are probably hiding behind the row of trees on the left and then engage in a mock battle. Such mock battles in front of huge audiences were central acts of many of Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows. By the time Elsie arrived at the Sheridan Inn that late summer day in 1908, Bill was no longer a regular in Sheridan, but there was evidence of his former intense involvement in the community everywhere. These are views of Sheridan Elsie might have seen in the distance on the train as it approached Sheridan, from the industrial section of the city to neighborhoods of stately homes to the back view of the bustling business district. While waiting a day or two for Ivy and family to come and get her, perhaps the inn provided a carriage for her and other guests to take to Main Street to explore what it had to offer. Twenty years earlier, in the late 1880s, here is what downtown Sheridan looked like when the population was less than 300, but now it was up over 8,000. 
So this is what Elsie would have seen when she entered the downtown area in 1908. The black tower rising over the stores is the city courthouse, with the dome of the much larger white county courthouse in the distance behind it. As you can tell from all the towering poles, the city was fully electrified by 1908. Downtown wasn't just for shopping. It was also a hub for entertainment venues, including this fine opera house, constructed in the 1890s, that featured vaudeville and plays brought to town by national touring groups. In fact, by 1912, there were nine different theaters in town, eventually hosting silent movies in addition to plays and vaudeville. And by 1912, there was also a new attraction in town, the only long-distance trolley line in the whole state of Wyoming. It ran day and night, serviced customers in downtown Sheridan, and also ran north out of town for 12 miles, reaching several small coal mining towns, such as Monarch and Acme, to bring miners and their families into Sheridan to do their shopping and perhaps enjoy the entertainment at the theaters. These mining towns, like Carneyville shown here, were actually company towns where the mine owners provided cottages for the workers, along with some stores and hotels and perhaps a church. All within walking distance of the mine. These booming mines and other Sheridan area enterprises, including the bustling rail and freight yards, attracted workers from far away, leading to an amazingly cosmopolitan population for the Sheridan area, including African Americans, Hispanics, and many immigrants from Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Hobos hopping the freight trains were also a frequent sight in Sheridan. This is the bustling world that Elsie Barnard would have stepped into when she got off the train. Population back in our little town of Fowlerville, Michigan was less than 1,000 at the time, with close to 100% of them likely of white Northern European ancestry. And thus I think we can safely suppose that walking down the main street in Sheridan for the first time, after traveling 1,400 miles by train across the land, would have been pretty mentally stimulating and emotionally exciting for a young woman of 19 who graduated high school in a class of eight people. With all this hustle and bustle in this cosmopolitan area, what sort of teaching job would you imagine was waiting for Miss Elsie Barnard, who had a solid two-year degree in education from a well-known progressive teaching college at the forefront of education in America at the time? The one thing you probably wouldn't imagine was this. Yes, I didn't get around to mentioning that the exciting Pearl, Montana teaching position Ivy was encouraging Elsie to apply for wasn't for a bustling modern school like the ones in Sheridan would have been, which would no doubt have had electric lighting and indoor plumbing and hundreds of students. Pearl was just a tiny little town right over the border from Wyoming, built to serve workers in a small coal mine in the area, and they just needed Elsie to be the teacher in a one-room school out in the middle of nowhere, many miles from Sheridan, with no electricity, no running water, no indoor bathrooms, teaching a handful of mine workers' children from kindergarten age to about 15. Elsie ended up teaching in more than one such school during the years she lived in Wyoming. She would have taught at five or six total. In among her photo collection, I found snapshots of four different buildings and four different groups of children, but only one was labeled on the back. So I'm not sure if that photo of Elsie and her class of five little barefoot children was the first school she taught at or not. That one would have been over the border into Montana where Ivy and her family lived. But I think that humble little building was probably it. The other smallest one of the four may have also been in Montana. The other two, only slightly larger, would have been in Wyoming, but far out in the countryside from bustling Sheridan near one of the mining company towns such as Monarch. On the back of the photo with the seven children, including four little girls in the front row, Elsie had written that it was taken in 1911 and that it was the Ash Creek, Wyoming school, which was relatively near where Elsie lived. She noted that the tall girl on the right was her cousin Ivy Gorder, whose family by then had moved from Montana to Wyoming. As you can see, the construction of two of these buildings is extremely rustic. I'm guessing that perhaps the families of the students got together to build the simple structures so that they could help provide an education for their children. Each of the two larger ones, with more uniform building materials, more solidly constructed, may have been provided by one of the mining companies. So, if Elsie was teaching at these schools far out in the countryside, where did she rent living quarters during her stay in Wyoming? 
That's something else I didn't get around to mentioning. She stayed here. And she didn't rent it. It was her own. Because at some point, either before heading out to Wyoming or sometime soon after she got there, Elsie decided to take advantage of the Homesteading Act. Under that governmental legislation, individuals and families could immigrate to a sparsely populated area and claim a piece of land of 160 acres as their own. The only stipulation was that they then must live on that land and improve it in some way for five years. At the end of that time, they would receive the permanent title to the land. This Elsie Barnard, small town Michigan girl with a penchant for pretty clothes and college classes, was forward thinking, resourceful, diligent, hardy, and brave enough at age 19 to decide to declare her own homestead in the dry rolling prairie land 20 miles north of downtown Sheridan, Wyoming, all by herself. With the help of Ivy's family and perhaps other relatives in the area, she built her own one-room cabin and took up residence. Note the handwritten note she put on the edge of this photo postcard years later, after she married and her last name changed to Barry. She cheekily notes that you are looking at Elsie Barnard Barry's mansion, Shady Nook, on Ash Creek in Wyoming, where she spent her next five years in order to have legal claim to her homestead. From the details on the homesteading papers that I found, I was able to pinpoint the location of her cabin on Google Maps. That's Sheridan at the bottom of the map, and the red arrow is right on top of the spot where the cabin was built. This is a close-up of Google Maps of the cabin's location. It was where the little heart is on the map. It was alongside a little dirt road named Ash Creek Road, right where another little dirt road named Little Ash Road intersected with it from the northwest. Google Maps tells me that it would take 36 minutes by automobile and modern roads to get from Shady Nook to downtown Sheridan. But of course, Elsie didn't have an automobile and there were no modern roads. The border with Montana was perhaps four or five miles straight north of Shady Nook by way of a very primitive dirt path. And the one or two Montana schools would have been even farther than that. Her transportation, both to get to Sheridan if she wanted to buy supplies and to get to school every morning was her horse she named Dandy. I checked the average speed that horseback riders could consistently ride over long distances. It seems to be no more than eight miles an hour. That would mean that it would have taken her somewhere between a half an hour and an hour to get to one of the schools, and far longer than that to get to Sheridan. Perhaps cousins or distant neighbors who also had homesteads in the general area might have given her a ride in a wagon to go shopping periodically. That would certainly have been more practical than trying to lug a 25-pound bag of flour home on Dandy's back. Here's Elsie on a frigid Wyoming's winter's day in about 1910, inviting you into Shady Nook. Five days a week during the school year, even in the wild Wyoming-Montana winters, she saddled up Dandy long before sunrise and rode to the school. She had to get there early so that she could stoke a fire in the heat stove and get the building warmed up before the children arrived. And by the time she got back to Shady Nook late in the day, the stove in her cabin would have likely already gone out and she'd have to stoke a fire in it before settling in for the evening. Did I mention that the average low temperature in January in the Sheridan area is 11 degrees and the record low was minus 36? Here is the Google Maps satellite view right now, a century later, of the area around where Shady Nook was. The whole region is still just as bleak and mostly uninhabited now as it was then. I can't speak for anyone else, but I cannot imagine myself at age 19 being brave enough or hardy enough to plan to live totally alone in a little cabin out in the middle of nowhere like this. I can't imagine myself at any age being that brave. Each adjacent homestead would have sprawled over 160 acres, so it's highly unlikely that any houses or cabins would have been very close nearby. Wouldn't she have been afraid of intruders? Evidently not, because in addition to her heat stove, Elsie packed heat, as they say, right on her person. As you saw earlier in this snapshot, showing the holster on her hip and the pistol in her hand, drawing a bead on the photographer. No, I don't think anyone messed with Elsie. Thank you.
But I don't want to leave you with the idea that Elsie became a hermit, holing up in her little one-room shady nook cabin, reading by dim light, basking in the heat of a potbelly stove like this one from the 1908 Sears catalog, and that she only got out to ride through the wild backcountry to spend daily time with a few children in another little one-room cabin serving as a school. Far from it. Even though Elsie had described herself as a bit of a loner in high school, she actually was also sociable, very adventurous, and curious about many things. We know that in particular because of one thing. You may be familiar with the type of young lady in the era at the beginning of the 20th century made famous by the iconic drawings of magazine illustrator Charles Dana Gibson. She was called the Gibson Girl. Gibson had created her famous look to show what he considered to be the epitome of what beautiful young modern women should look and act like. They all invariably had that impossibly imposing mountainous pile of hair, tousled but perfectly tamed, which along with her droopy eyes and inevitably pouty lips, gave her what Gibson obviously envisioned as a come-hither look. Their bodies were uniformly sculpted by a tight-fitting S-shaped corset that yielded the perfect female form according to Gibson. Their clothes were always the latest fashion, their demeanor frostily upper class. They were allowed to do active things outdoors, but the activities always looked like merely an opportunity to pose, not to be truly athletic in any way. They could play golf, play croquet, even ride a bike, but without ruining their perfect hair and perfect pout and perfect S-shaped posture. Yes, the Gibson girl was admired by most men and envied by both older women and young teens, and both older and younger women often attempted in vain to imitate the look. But at the exact same time that Charles Gibson and others illustrators were attempting to mold the American young woman into a cookie-cutter version of the Gibson girl, the Kodak Corporation offered to the public an alternative ideal young woman. In 1888, the Eastman Kodak Company had marketed the first camera aimed at amateur photographers, a leather-bound box style. At a price of $25, the equivalent of over $700 now, sales were limited to the upper classes. Prices came down gradually throughout the 1890s, but they still left snapshot cameras out of reach of most people in lower middle class and lower class families. From the very beginning, Kodak enthusiastically marketed its cameras to women. Through the 1890s, they used women models in Kodak ads and dubbed them Kodak girls. At that time, they closely resembled Gibson girls. But in the early years of the 20th century, Kodak went for a different look for its Kodak girls. This thoroughly modern young woman didn't have an S-shaped body and droopy eyes and pouty lips, and didn't hang out in tea parlors or pose with other sullen-looking young women on a beach. The new ideal Kodak girl was slender and athletic in comfortable clothes with a big smile and wide-open eyes, and obviously full of enthusiasm for getting out and actually engaging the world. And her favorite way to do this was to pack her handheld camera and go look for excitement and beauty and fun to snap. And then there was the biggest boost that allowed most such young women to be part of the snapshot generation. In 1900, the Kodak Corporation introduced the Brownie Camera, constructed of heavy cardboard and designed to cost only $1, the equivalent of about $20 in the 21st century. In the year 1908, our Elsie Barnard was the proud owner of just such a camera, perhaps a college graduation present. And of course, she took it along on her adventure to Wyoming. I say all that to tell you that Elsie Beatrice Barnard was indeed the quintessential Kodak girl. And I'll prove that to you in the next section of this video, where we will be viewing a sample of the many snapshots she took while living in Wyoming. Because she didn't just sit in her little cabin all the time and read when she wasn't teaching school. In her spare time, Elsie was always out looking for an adventure, something new and different to see, a new place to explore, new people to meet, sometimes alone, sometimes bringing a friend or two along, as you see in this snapshot, showing her with two of her friends posing wrapped in Indian blankets. They were likely visiting the Montana Crow Indian Reservation a few miles from her homestead. That's Elsie on the left. She must have handed her camera to someone so she could be included in the photo. I wondered if the crows still lived in teepees at the time when Elsie was living nearby, or if she and her friends were just visiting a tourist display of the way the crow had lived in times past. 
A quick Google search made it clear that this was indeed the typical crow dwelling at the time. These beautiful photos of crow on that reservation in 1910 make it clear that the old ways were still in place at that time, although changes were coming soon. But 30 miles or so away from those simple teepees, at the very same time, the bustling modern city of Sheridan was going about its business. And our Kodak girl captured its essence, too. Here's one of my favorite of Elsie's snapshots of her time in Wyoming. This almost looks like an English bobby, but it is instead a snapshot Elsie took of a Sheridan policeman wearing the spiffy uniform of the time that the police department of Sheridan picked out for their police force. Here's that same Western Bobby giving a mock stern lecture to some rowdy bicyclist. And I hope that biker mended his ways or he could have ended up in this Sheridan paddy wagon on his way to the Hooskow. Between downtown Sheridan and the Crow Reservation over the border in Montana was a wide expanse of prairie grassland sweeping up the foothills of the Bighorn Mountains, and Elsie spent time exploring it also. The next three snapshots were taken when she was drawn to check out the details of an irrigation building project near her homestead. The prairie lands were very dry, not lending themselves to agriculture. But in the early 1900s, Wyoming was encouraging a new experiment to try irrigation farming. Here you see a structure taking water through a pipe from a small water source in a little valley, up a cliffside, and entering the bottom of a chute built out over the edge. Elsie was not only able to snap the structure, but the woman perched atop the structure with work hat and work gloves, evidently involved in some way with the operation. At the top of the cliff, she snapped a small steam engine that was running a pump that was pulling the water up that pipe. And in her third snapshot of the series, she shows the chute bringing the water coming up over the edge of the cliff in the distance, running past the steam pump and out into an irrigation stream that had been created. Sitting next to the end of the chute, two workers appear to be inspecting the water in some way as it rushes by. Even with the irrigation, agricultural growth never took off in the area, but the prairie lands were indeed good for grazing cattle, and Elsie captured some photos of cattle and horsemen. I would guess maybe she took these snapshots while sitting high in the saddle on Dandy. I noticed that this second photo shows a woman on horseback in the distance. It would be interesting to know if she was a ranch woman accompanying male ranchers in the field, tending to the cattle in some way, or just a visitor like Elsie. Included in Elsie's Wyoming snapshots are several couples and families. I'm not sure which might be her relatives, which might be friends, and which might be from neighboring homesteads. And here is my very favorite of all the Western folks Elsie captured with her camera. I'd love to know this fellow's backstory. Here is a universally popular, cheerful subject for snapshots from that time to this. A smiling Wyoming man and his dog showing off her litter of puppies for Elsie's camera. At one point during Elsie's five-year stay in Wyoming, Brother Harry came out to visit her. Here he is posing for Elsie next to a steam tractor. Yes, Elsie was a typical Kodak girl of her time, but there's another role Elsie had that is quite surprising. Elsie was a voter. Check out the message on this postcard she sent to her mother in 1912. Dear Mother, I am going over to vote today. We'll write soon. Your loving Elsie. I'm pretty sure she wrote that with a gleeful snicker, because of course her own mother would not be voting that year. National women's suffrage didn't come until the passing of the 19th Amendment in 1920. But women in Wyoming had been voting for over 40 years by the time Elsie moved there. When Wyoming was still a territory, legislators passed the Wyoming Suffrage Act of 1869. This act gave women in the territory the right to vote. And when Wyoming became a state in 1890, they retained the right to vote. There had been some pressure from legislators in D.C. for Wyoming to abandon women's suffrage as part of the deal to acquire statehood. But the Wyoming men declared they would not come into the United States without their women, and they won out. And thus, in fall 1912, Elsie headed out to vote for her choice for President of the United States. I have no idea whether she voted for Woodrow Wilson or not. Elsie may have voted in a local election even earlier. The town of Dayton, near her homestead, was where Elsie attended church. In May 1911, Dayton held an election for mayor. 
One of the contestants was a former teacher named Susan Whistler. Mrs. Whistler had run on a platform promising to clean up the town, particularly to curb gambling and to regulate the operation of saloons. She won handily and went on to serve two terms as mayor, four years total. Susan was the first female mayor in Wyoming and one of the first in the whole United States. I've shown some of Elsie's girlfriends, but I haven't mentioned any boyfriends. I do know she had more than one. I'm pretty sure, for instance, that this is one, evidently snapped when they were visiting downtown Sheridan. And it's obvious she thought enough of this one to want him to pose on Dandy. And this one, of the same chap, may have been taken on the same day. At least he's wearing that same striped suit for a visit to the Indian Reservation. Don't know if it was him or someone else who sent her these two greeting postcards during her stay in Wyoming. There was no signature on either, but they indicate a bit more than just a platonic relationship. But whoever the sender was, the relationship obviously came to an end a few months after Elsie got this July 1914 document in the mail. It requests the final document needed for her to get the deed to her homestead. By early fall, she had emptied Shady Nook of all her possessions, said goodbye to all her Wyoming and Montana friends and family, and went back to the CB&Q train station in Sheridan to head back to Michigan. Whatever didn't fit on the train with her, she had family box up and ship back to Michigan. They sent this postcard from Decker, Montana in October 1915, asking if she'd received the shipment yet. No, Elsie hadn't ever intended to make that homestead her permanent home, nor to stay in Wyoming. She invested her time and efforts in Wyoming just to obtain the deed to the property as an investment for her future. Elsie's photos and documents I have lose track of her for a couple of years right after she received that 1914 homesteading paper. I did do a search for her on the internet during that period and caught a glimpse of her in January 1917. The Lansing State Journal newspaper had a short blurb mentioning her name in a little story sent in from their correspondent in Fowlerville. At a recent meeting of the Rebecca Women's Club there, Elsie Barnard had been installed to the Office of Corresponding Secretary. I learned from other records I've been able to dig up online that some time between the date of that Rebecca meeting in January and the month of July 1917, Elsie Beatrice Barnard married a man named George Berry and changed her name to Elsie Beatrice Barnard Berry. Her new husband, George, was born in Fowlerville in 1881, making him about eight years older than Elsie. I believe this portrait of him is from about 1895 when he would have been a young teen. And this portrait appears to be a bit later, about 1900, when he would be almost 20. George had moved away from Fowlerville at one point and married a woman named Susie, who gave birth to a son named Herbert in 1912. Sometime between 1912 when Herbert was born and 1917 when George married Elsie, he had become divorced from Susie and moved back to Fowlerville. I assume it was probably close to nine months after the marriage, on April 9, 1918, when Elsie and George's first child was born, a girl named Lucy after her own mother, Lucy Barnard. Just three days earlier, on April 6, 1917, the U.S. had declared its entry into World War I. By then, George Berry was about 36 years old and thus not subject to the draft. I don't know what he was doing for a living at the time he and Elsie got married, but within a, few, within a few months after Lucy's birth, he took a war-related job working at the docks in Norfolk, Virginia, connected to the huge Norfolk Naval Station. The Naval Station was brand new in 1917, with construction on it begun after the U.S. declared war in April. By 1918, there were 34,000 enlisted men at the base, along with many more people like George Berry doing support work. The government needed to house the families of workers, so at one point, they appropriated all the large summer homes in a beach resort area nearby and turned them into temporary year-round housing for workers and their families. George, Elsie, and Lucy Berry moved into the house shown here in late 1918. You can see Elsie pulling little Lucy down the beach in front of two of the resort homes in what appears to be something like a sand sled. And there is George Berry, walking with Lucy along the shore. The resort was on Willoughby Spit, a little peninsula jutting out from the mainland at the north end of Norfolk. 
On one side of it was a small body of water called Willoughby Bay, and on the other side was Chesapeake Bay, an inlet of the Atlantic Ocean. Around Willoughby Bay on the opposite shore was the Norfolk Naval Station. On February 18, 1919, Elsie wrote a letter to a friend that describes a bit of what it was like to live in this summer resort in the wintertime. There is a terrible wind this morning and I just can't keep warm. These houses are built for summer use only and the wind comes in all around, though I think ours is pretty good. George got some wood on the beach yesterday, and there must be a lot this morning, but it's so cold and windy to get out. You see, we are between Chesapeake Bay and a small bay, Willoughby, and the land is just wide enough for two rows of houses and the road and tracks between, so we get all the breeze. We are on the little bay side, so it's not quite so bad. Well, it just this minute started to snow, but it's not as bad as Michigan. We've had just two cold days here this winter. Two days before Elsie wrote her letter, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution establishing prohibition was ratified by the states. So she incorporated a little joke about it in her letter. Lucy is waking up and I must give her her bottle. U.S. is going dry, but I guess they haven't put a ban on baby bottles yet. Actually, the amendment didn't officially go into effect until a year after ratification on January 17, 1920. Also in the letter, Elsie mentioned that a few weeks earlier, on December 13th, a hydroplane was wrecked on the house across the road from her with two people killed. The plane evidently hit the house and then ricocheted off into the water at the edge of the beach in front of the house, as I'm pretty sure these snapshots by Elsie were taken of that incident. Hydroplanes, usually referred to as flying boats at the time by the Navy, were a regular sight in the area as men were trained to fly them at the naval base. I was able to track down via Google the exact model of plane that had crashed. After the United States entered the war, the Curtis Model F flying boat was adopted as the U.S. Navy's standard primary training flying boat. It is thus what would have been regularly flying from the Naval Station. This is a photo of the world's only fully restored and operational Curtis Model F flying boat, which allows you to see the beautiful wood that the plane was made from. Here are snapshots Elsie took of a site over Willoughby Spit that would not have been common. This is an airship passing high overhead. Although it wasn't a common sight, just such an airship, an Italian vessel called the Roma, actually did plunge a thousand feet from the sky and crash at the naval station in 1922, killing 34 people on board. As an older man, Elsie's husband George was logically in a position as a supervisor rather than a laborer at the docks. Here is George and his fun-loving motley crew on the job on a day when Elsie visited their job site. In amongst the men in their dirty, rugged work clothes and work caps, there is George, the obvious boss man in a jaunty fedora and suit with his arms crossed. With a handsome, beaming smile on George Berry's face, he looks to me a bit like Gene Kelly about to break into a song and dance in these photos. Sometime a year or so after the move to Norfolk, Elsie gave birth to a second daughter she named Doris. On the right is a photo of Elsie and Lucy admiring baby Doris on the porch of their beach home. Sadly, little Doris died during a whooping cop epidemic in about 1920 while still in infancy and while the family was still living in Virginia. At this point, the photos and documentation I have of Elsie enter a long, silent period, except for a few photos of little Lucy. I know that by the time these portraits of Lucy were made in about 1924, the family was back in Michigan. This snapshot of her and her dolly, obviously from the same period since she has on that same enormous bow from the portrait sitting, show her in front of a totally different kind of house than the one they had stayed in at Virginia. All of the summer homes on Willoughby Spit were built, as you see in this example, with the first floor raised four feet or so from the beach, with long front steps leading up to the porch. This was to prevent flooding of the main house in circumstances such as high tides or even hurricanes. Only by searching for George Washington Berry online recently did I discover what happened next and when. This is an entry for George Berry on Ancestry.com, a website that allows folks to explore the genealogy of their family. As you see from this information, he died in 1927 at age 46 in Lansing, Michigan. I'm pretty sure the cause was not an accident, but the result of serious chronic health problems he'd been struggling with for years. 
I remember Elsie talking a time or two about struggles he had with breathing and a heart condition in the final years of their marriage. From the time of husband George Berry's death until her own death in 1976, Elsie evidently stayed in the Lansing area. Here she is, noted in the 1940 census at age 51, living in Lansing with her daughter Lucy, age 22. It's amazing how easy it is to track tidbits of information online of almost anyone's family. In 1942, Elsie took an introductory course in engineering. She kept this ring-bound notebook of class notes written in her very precise handwriting, interspersed with her own hand-drawn diagrams of various tools. Included were handwritten overviews of many items that she then turned into typed manuscripts, and at least one homework assignment that she had turned in returned with a grade of 100 on it. There are two homemade large envelopes bound into the notebook. One still contains a compass, the other a small booklet of trigonometry tables. One page seemed to have a list of classmates with their contact information, including the old-style telephone numbers of the time, with just five digits. If I were a guessing person, I would guess that Elsie took a wartime job in a factory in Lansing that required knowledge of this material. But the most puzzling thing to me about this notebook when I looked through it was this page, which shows her not using the name Elsie Barnard Berry, but Elsie B. Anderson. There had never been any mention in the years I knew Elsie of any other marriage other than that to George Berry. I asked my husband about it, and he had never heard anyone in his family mention it either. But I later found in this 1946 document that explained the situation. It is a legal declaration of the dissolving of a marriage between Elsie B. Barnard and a man named Frank Anderson on the grounds of extreme cruelty by Frank. The document makes mention of joint property they bought together in 1936, so she was married to him for over 10 years from about age 47 through 57. But this document's the only evidence that it ever happened. The document mentions at the end that Elsie would be assuming again her name from before the marriage to Anderson, and she went back to being Elsie Barnard Berry. In 1944, her daughter Lucy married John Dewey, and they had a son, Lucy, named George, after her own father, George Berry. Here's my husband George, back when he was little Georgie, at about age two, looking just like his grandpa George back in the day with a suit and jaunty fedora. Well, he didn't look quite like Grandpa George at that point, but I'm guessing Grandma Elsie was a bit startled by what young George looked like as he grew into a teenager. He bore a striking resemblance to what George Berry had looked like as a teen. Same cleft chin, same eyes, same thick wavy hair. The first time I ran across these portraits of young George Berry in about the year 2000, it really startled me. He looked so much like my George had looked at 20 when we got married in 1965. They could have easily been close cousins. At the time little Georgie was born in 1944, it had been 30 years since Elsie claimed her homestead in Wyoming, leased the land to a nearby rancher for cattle grazing to get enough money to pay for the early taxes, and moved back east and got on with her life. By 1949, at age 60, Elsie's main source of income was a small one-woman real estate business she ran out of her home, with the assistance at times of her brother Harry, who was in his late 60s by then. She would buy shabby homes in rundown areas, use her own physical efforts and those of Harry to repair and spruce them up a bit, and then sell them on land contract to low-income folks. When I met her in 1965, she was still involved in this business well up into her 70s. But in 1952, her income took a big uptick. Early in 1952, oil was discovered under Elsie Barnard Berry's humble homestead land. And in a short time, the Shell Oil Company paid her to allow them to drill a well, which immediately began producing. Which meant a steady stream of royalties sent by check from the Shell Oil Company to the hardy, adventurous, but wise and sensible woman who decided at age 19 to start building for her future. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't a vast fortune, but it certainly would have been a welcome boost to her very meager real estate business income and her savings. I discovered among her mementos an envelope with the check stubs for her royalty payments for the 12 months of 1956. 
The total for the whole year of 1956 was just over $3,500. Factoring in inflation, that amount would be worth about $35,000 today. I'm not sure if the earlier years before 1956 yielded more oil, but I do know that as the years passed after 1956, the production dwindled down year by year, and by 1970 or so, the well went dry. In the summer of 1952, after the oil well had been up and running for a while, Elsie and Lucy and young Georgie took an auto trip out to Wyoming to see it for themselves. Here's the first evidence they would have seen. And then, down the road, eight miles, there it was. And here is E. Berry herself, standing in front of the E. Berry No. 1 oil well. During their Wyoming visit, Elsie and Lucy and Georgie stayed at the home of Elsie's cousin Alice, whom you see with Elsie in these two photos. Alice was a sister of Elsie's cousin Ivy, the one who had originally invited her to Wyoming. And while in the area, Elsie was finally able to visit Shady Nook after all those years had passed. You have to wonder what sort of memories flooded through her mind as she stood there leaning against it. Then again, Elsie never did seem to be the sort who spent much time dwelling on the past. She seemed to be always deciding what to do next. So what do you think she did next? A fascinating parallel occurred to me just as I was pulling this narrative together. Because the next noteworthy thing Elsie did was the same thing this rural family did when oil was discovered on their property 10 years later, in 1962. Yes, when oil was discovered on the property of the Clampett family of rural Missouri and the oil well royalties started rolling in, they decided to pack up and go to California. Beverly Hills, to be exact, a stone's throw from Hollywood. And less than a year after that photo was taken of Elsie at her old cabin, Elsie realized that the royalties from her oil well could provide her plenty of extra finances that would allow her to realize a dream she'd evidently had for some time. She made plans to go visit Hollywood. This would be the longest trip Elsie had ever taken, and it wouldn't be by train this time or plane. She was going to make the solo trip by auto all 2,300 miles from Lansing, Michigan to Hollywood, California at age 63. Of course, there was no interstate highway system at the time. There is no doubt at all that the route she would have taken would have been the one down America's Highway, Route 66, that went all the way from Chicago to L.A. There were no national chain motels yet, like Holiday Inns, so she would have stayed at the earlier version of overnight accommodations, motor courts. And with no national chains of inexpensive fast food places along the highways, like McDonald's yet, she would have stopped at diners along the way. What I know of specifics of her trip to Hollywood, I gleaned from these two pieces of paper she had kept. These are schedules from the studios of NBC and ABC of the times that various television programs were being filmed. They were provided to Hollywood visitors who wished to sit in as part of the audience on one or more programs. Elsie wrote letters to daughter Lucy back home in Michigan on the backs of these programs, chronicling what she'd been doing. Here are the listings for the NBC programs. And here are the listings for the ABC programs. She also attended some CBS programs, but that program wasn't included in the papers I found. The first letter was written on May 16, and she had already been in town for at least two weeks by then, since she mentions that she had sent a large parcel back home to Lucy on May 1st. And at the end of the second letter, she mentions that if Lucy needs to contact her, her address until May 26 would be 1607 Gower Street in Hollywood. That means her stay in the area must have been for well over a month. When I first saw these letters, I jumped to the conclusion Elsie had some friend or relative in the area with whom she could stay while she was exploring Hollywood. And I assumed they lived on the Gower Street address, probably in a residential area in some suburb of L.A. near Hollywood. I found out from a Google search only recently I was wrong. 
Turns out that in 1953, 1607 Gower Street was the location of a major temporary residential hotel called the Gower Plaza Hotel. It wasn't at the edge or outside of Hollywood. It was a classy hotel two blocks from the corner of Hollywood and Vine, the famous central point in Hollywood, where the famous Hollywood Walk of Fame with all the stars are embedded in the sidewalk. The Gower Plaza Hotel doesn't exist anymore. But from the 1920s through the 1950s, it was right in the center of things in Hollywood, where, along with a lot of tourists, a number of famous and wannabe famous folks evidently stayed at times. Mention was made on the web that James Dean had stayed at the Gower Plaza for a short time early in his career in 1951, and that Marilyn Monroe had stayed there multiple times in the early 1950s. And in 1953, it was hosting famous homesteader and oil well owner Elsie Barnard Berry. As Elsie wrote her first letter on the back of a TV schedule on May 16, she was standing in line at the NBC Hollywood TV studios at 9.30 on a Saturday morning, hoping to get a ticket when the doors opened at 10 to the Bob Hope show that would be filming later that day. By the end of the letter, she reported she had to wait in line for an hour, but she did manage to snag a ticket she wanted. Now she just had to wait for another hour and a half until showtime. She wrote to Lucy that she'd already been in the audience for a filming of several other shows in previous days, starring Jack Benny, Art Linkletter, Dennis Day, Dinah Shore, and Eve Arden as Our Miss Brooks. Her favorite seemed to have been the filming of the I Love Lucy show, as she sat in the audience just the night before. She mentions that the plot line included Lu Desi putting Lucy on a balcony with a rose clenched in her teeth and serenading her. Amazingly, with Elsie's description and the date given, I was able to find photos and clips on the internet of that exact I Love Lucy episode. You can see Lucy here on that balcony with the rose in her mouth, with Ricky below, singing while facing the audience. What Elsie didn't mention was what happened next. Lucy had plotted secretly before the show with Fred Mertz to have her body attached to wires so she could be lifted up in the air and do all sorts of silly acrobatic tricks on the banister behind Ricky that would make the audience laugh. I found an actual clip of this scene on YouTube so you can see a tiny bit of what Elsie saw. The main thing I want you to notice in this film clip you are about to see is not Lucy's antics or Ricky's singing. It is the laughter of the live audience. Yes, this was before canned audience laughter. So you are hearing people right in the room with the actors spontaneously laughing at the action on stage as it happens. And somewhere in that room is our own Elsie Barnard Berry laughing with everyone else. So you will actually be hearing the laughter of the lady whose story you've been watching in this documentary. Twelve years after Elsie's Hollywood trip, when I first met her, her big Hollywood adventure was no doubt a fading memory. Neither she nor anyone in the family mentioned that it had happened, so I only learned of it when I found her documents in 2000. Now I sure wish I could have known about it back in the late 1960s and early 1970s and picked her brain about all the things she saw and experienced there at the center of the action in the bustling first years of the new phenomenon of television. But instead, the Elsie I knew in the early 1970s just went to boring rock club meetings, gently played with her new little great-granddaughter Ramona, and quietly tended to the tiny flower beds in her tiny backyard. Here I am with Ramona and my husband George visiting Elsie in 1974. 
As I look back at pictures like this now, I see the wasted opportunities I missed every time we visited to encourage Elsie to talk about her past, what tales she could have told. But all too soon she was gone, buried in 1976 back in Fowlerville next to George Berry. Too soon for me to be wise enough to have gotten to know the real Elsie Beatrice Barnard Berry. Over 20 years later in 1998, our family, including Ramona and her two children, Elsie's great-great-grandchildren Jonathan and Katie, took Lucy on a final trip to Wyoming to see Elsie's old homestead. Lucy was 80 at the time and died two years later. While visiting Sheridan, we took time to take a 150-mile side trip to see Devil's Tower made famous in the movie Close Encounters. But the most poignant Close Encounter of our Wyoming trip was when we turned west off a main highway north of Sheridan onto Little Ash Creek Road. And a few miles down that road, there it was, the intersection with Little Ash Road, making a little V between them where Shady Nook once stood. The cabin was long gone. George told me later he had heard that it didn't just crumble into ruins. Someone had actually taken the effort to haul it away in one piece to use as an outbuilding on a ranch. But if you squinted your eyes and let your mind wander, you could almost see the cabin right where it belonged with young Elsie Beatrice Barnard, homesteader, standing in the doorway. The spot was down in a little shallow valley. We drove on down Ash Creek Road just a bit as it rode up to the level of the prairie above. We found a place to pull off still within the 160 acres of Elsie's homestead and got out of our car to get a look at the scene that Elsie would have seen in 1914 if she rode Dandy up to that same spot. Here you see Elsie's great-great-grandson, Jonathan, inspecting the jumping bugs in the prairie grass with the beginning foothills of the Bighorn Mountains in the distance. And if you squint your eyes and you let your mind wander, you might also almost see Elsie Beatrice Barner atop her faithful steed Dandy riding off into the sunset. <laughs>